Welcome to a Programming Languages Virtual Meetup pre-recording. My name is Connor Hookstra, and in today's video, we're going to be covering Chapter 2 of Seven Languages in Seven Weeks by Bruce Tate. And in this video summary, we are going to be covering our first of seven programming languages, Ruby. Note that this is not going to be a comprehensive summary of the chapter. We are going to pick and choose what we cover and add a bit of color to things that aren't covered in the text. So definitely go and purchase the book, read the chapter first, then come back and watch this video. So starting with a quick history of Ruby. Ruby was created by Yukihiro Matsumoto in 1993. Most people just called him Mats. As a language, Ruby is an interpreted, object-oriented, dynamically typed language from a family of so-called scripting languages. Interpreted means that Ruby code is executed by an interpreter rather than a compiler. I will let you read the rest of this text, and if you want, just pause the video. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but, uh, you know, high-level summary of the quick history of Ruby. The next thing I'm going to cover is there's sort of an interview that happens with Mats. And um, Matt's at one point says, in 1993, when I saw Perl, I was somehow inspired that an object-oriented language that combines characteristics from Lisp, Smalltalk, and Perl would be a great language to enhance our productivity. So this is in response to Bruce asking Matt's, you know, why did you create the language? So really interesting to know that the inspiration was three different languages, Smalltalk, Lisp, and Perl. And it's really a shame. This is only one of two times in this chapter that Smalltalk is mentioned, when really R Ruby is just Smalltalk. It's Smalltalk with Perl syntax and the object model, blocks, the algorithm names, the message names. They're all taken from Smalltalk. You know, this should, this should really be like Ruby slash Smalltalk. And it's a real shame that Smalltalk only gets mentioned twice. So Smalltalk is going to be a recurring thing. Uh, in this video summary. So if we see here, we've got Perl, Smalltalk, and Lisp um, inspiring the design of Ruby. And it is very interesting to note that Ruby was one of the main inspirations for the new functional language Elixir, which is also a combination of three languages. You, there's a few other languages as well. Python has also influenced, but many times you'll hear uh, Jose Valim talk about uh, Clojure, uh, Erlang and Ruby being the three main inspirations for Elixir. And you can even see that the logos of these two languages, Ruby and Elixir, are supposed to both sort of be like, you know, gemstones um, to indicate that, you know, one inspired the other. And I don't think it is a coincidence at all that all three of these languages are going to show up in this book, Seven Languages in Seven Weeks. If we take a look at all of the books that Bruce Tate has authored, we will see an interesting pattern. I did not take the time to sort these chronologically uh, because I was lazy, but if we see his first three books were on Java, then his next two books were on Ruby, then all the other books other than his seven language series are on Elixir. So I think that this book was written uh, knowing that in the future he was going to change directions from Ruby and go in the Elixir direction. So uh, covering Clojure, Erlang, and Ruby all in this book was sort of helping with the background of the languages that inspired Elixir, which he has written the most books on. So I think context here, really cool, and just interesting to note that Perl, Smalltalk, Lisp all inspired Ruby, and then Ruby along with Clojure and Erlang. Um, a lot of people just say that basically Elixir is uh, the Erlang model with Ruby syntax. Obviously, there's a lot more going on, but um, very simplified statement. I've heard that a few times. That will wrap up chapter 2.1. Moving on to day one, really uh, diving deep into Ruby. Like I said, we're not going to cover everything here. Go read the chapter first and then come back and watch this video. Here is some of the code that's highlighted in the book. So here we have a list of four different strings. Note that there are two different types of strings, strings with single quotes and strings with double quotes. Uh, the double quote strings, you can use this sort of octothorpe brace in order to have string replacement, which is kind of cute. And yeah, moving on to our next slide. Here, you start to see the object model. You can go four dot class and you get it returned in the interactive uh, Ruby. Um, it tells you that it's an integer. You can check all the methods. This is very small talk like. Um, you can do the exact same thing in a small talk, um, basically IDE like Faro. And you can do things like sort methods and you can even search through these methods because it's just an array of uh, methods. So really cool. 
Skipping to the end of this uh, chapter section with a few exercises, we're going to do uh, or show the answers to four of these. Print the string, hello world. Print the string, uh, hello Ruby, and find the index of, or for the string, hello Ruby, find the index of the word Ruby. Print your name 10 times and then print the string. This is a sentence number one where the number one is changed from one to 10. So the first two answers, pretty straightforward, puts hello world and then puts hello Ruby dot index and then you're searching for Ruby, and that's going to give you seven. Note that you can do something very similar to sort of message searching in a small talk IDE like Faro, where you basically on your uh, string, you can do dot methods and then dot filter, and then with the block, search which of the uh, messages after you convert them to strings uh, include a certain substring. So I didn't actually know. Uh, what the name of you know the message or method that returns the index of a substring so i just did this i did you know string dot methods dot filter and then in my block i convert the message to a string and then see if it includes the substring index because i figured it would either be index or fine and note that uh, the list of messages returns uh, index and our index so you can sort of really interactively explore the language which i think is awesome and this is super super reminiscent of small talk for anyone that's played with that language Moving on to the next two exercises of day one, print your name 10 times, plethora of way to do these. Um, the easiest I thought was just puts uh, my string, uh, my name in a string uh, times 10 with a little backslash n to get new lines. And then uh, print the string. This is a sentence. This is sentence number where the number is changing. You have to make use of the double quoted strings with the octothorpe brace brace, uh, which is pretty cool. And we're making use of the range class and the each method as well. Moving on to uh, chapter section 2.3 and day two floating down from the sky. Uh, very quickly, some highlights. Um, we've got the object model here where, you know, everything is a subclass ultimately of object. We've got object module class and then numeric integer fixed num. Uh, this is borrowed directly from Smalltalk. Um, another thing here, we've got our methods on our sort of range class, and this is, you know, exists for enumerables and lists and whatnot. We've got collect, which is your functional transformer map. Um, we've got select, which is basically your functional filter. And you've got inject, which is a reduction. Note there's two different versions. One takes an initial value zero. The other one doesn't take an initial value. And you can also do different things where you pass a, a block or you use parentheses and ampersand colon uh, for whatever message you want to do. So here you can do it with uh, ampersand colon plus in order to add all your, the numbers from one to five. Also, you can just use the convenience function sum. Um, once again, these are all taken from small talk. Very, very fun fact here is that you might think that, you know, why not use map, filter, and reduce or fold like most languages? Well, these names come actually from a song. Uh, there's a link I will put it in the description down below of this article that's entitled Injected, Inspected, Detected, Infected, Neglected, and Selected. And um, these function names or method names come from a song called Alice's Restaurant by Arlo Guthrie because back in the day in the 80s, I don't know, someone thought this was cute. So there's a lyric in the song that has you get injected, inspected, detected, infected, neglected, and selected. And so basically, uh, someone stole or borrowed these um, sort of rhyming names because they thought it sounded cool. And so collect, select, inject, uh, reject, um, and I think a few other ones, neglect, are all basically mes methods on small talk Ob uh, objects and then Ruby borrowed it from Smalltalk. So pretty cool, uh, neat piece of programming language lore here. And once again, like I said, this, sh this chapter should be called Ruby slash Smalltalk because really Ruby just borrowed all this stuff from Smalltalk. Another thing that I think is sort of fun to correct here, um, this paragraph talks about different uh, casing styles. Specifically, two of them mentioned are camel case and underscore style. Um, this is not camel case, this is Pascal case. Camel case has a lower case for the first letter and underscore style is one name for this, but it's more commonly known as snake case. And here is a really cool graphic from the internet that sort of uh, demonstrates this. So we've got snake case at the bottom, which is lowercase letters and underscores. Camel case starts with a lowercase and then subsequent words are capitalized. And then you can see here down in the bottom right, Pascal case, otherwise known as upper camel, is another one. Kebab case is what Clojure uses or a lot of Lisps use. This is hyphenated and lowercase. And then screaming snake case is for uppercase with underbars. Um, important to know this as a software engineer. Moving on to uh, the next thing that we're going to highlight is that uh, this is just sort of a random note, but the chapter mentions a programming language that I had never heard of called Flavors. 
And uh, that's basically a common Lisp dialect or sort of a spin-off of common Lisp. Anyways, um, pretty cool. Never heard of it. And at some point, maybe I'll look into this a bit more. Moving to the end of day two, we're only going to look at one exercise, which I thought this one was really, really cool. I highly recommend if you haven't done the exercises, uh, exercises, go and do this one, um, which is write a simple grep that will print the lines of a file having any occurrences of a phrase anywhere in that line. You will need to do a simple regular expression match and read lines from a file. This is surprisingly simple in Ruby. If you want, include numbers. Um, I didn't do any regex. You don't, you don't need to do regex uh, for this problem. And this is basically the full solution, including line numbers. So you basically just go puts file.open and then for each line, each with index, which is going to bundle basically the line number uh, with each of the lines. And then you're going to select, which is the uh, functional filter in Ruby, which once again taken from Smalltalk, that name. And then in your block, you have your line and your index, and you're checking, does your line include a substring? So I just checked puts because that's common, and I'm searching through the solutions for this chapter. And then once you have filtered all your lines for only the ones that include puts, uh, you can transform them using collect, and then once again, you've got your line and your number. You convert your uh, line number to a string and justify it uh, so that you've got sort of four spaces. And then I also went and replaced all of the spaces with hyphens just to make it look a little bit prettier. And once you do this, you get a really, really nice output uh, with the numbers sort of aligned on the left, and then each, each uh, Ruby line in your source code file that has the puts substring. Really, really awesome. Honestly, this piece of code here, if you like Python, you should consider learning Ruby because in my opinion, Ruby and this kind of, uh, it's really not functional at all because you're basically just message chaining, which is once again from small talk, you basically have uh, messages, keyword messages and unary messages that you chain one after another. Um, in small talk, you just use spaces. Here you use the dot operator on your objects. But yeah, uh, it's extremely elegant, ends up feeling very functional. Um, something that you might sort of, you're composing functions, but uh, anyways, awesome, love it, Ruby, the best, um, nicer than Python, at least for this kind of this this kind of code, in my opinion. Anyways, moving on to the final day, day three, uh, we're going to skip to the end and just do the final exercise because I don't want this video to be 30 minutes long, and it is basically building on top of some examples that are covered in the textbook, and it asks you to modify the CSV application to support an each method and to return a CSV row object, which you're going to have to define. And it says using method missing, which is honestly, I think a really bad language design, but a kind of cute trick. Um, so it says using uh, mess method missing on that CSV row to return the value for the column uh, for a given heading. Um, so basically, you can do this thing in uh, Ruby, where if you try and call uh, a method that doesn't exist on a class, um, but you do have a method missing, it'll try and handle that basically method that you call that doesn't exist. So I think it's a terrible idea, but it leads to cute little tricks that you can do. So we'll click, we'll quickly look at the code that you just need to add. So this won't make much sense if you haven't worked through the example. Um, but basically you take one of your classes, you go over three different versions of this. So I'm just using uh, one of them called access CSV. You add the method each and you pass a block into it and then uh, for basically your result, which is one of the members of this class, access CSV, uh, for each of those, you are going to, for your block, call, uh, and then construct a CSV row, and basically uh, pass that constructed CSV row, uh, CSV row um, to the block.call. And on top of this, you need to create the CSV row class, which is going to be pretty simple. It's got two uh, methods, initialize and the method missing. So initialize is just going to uh, store your two members, row and headers. And then use it using method missing. So basically, the method that you're going to try and call is the name of the header of uh, one of your columns. And so it's going to use that name to basically convert that uh, to a string and then figure out what index is this, and then look that up uh, in your rows. Um, like I said, kind of cute. Do I think it's a good idea? Probably not. Uh, but yeah, that's the last thing we're going to cover. So I think this is kind of the, the most interesting thing to remember. Perl, small talk lisp is what uh, led to Ruby. And then when you combine the Erlang OTP model uh, with Ruby and then throw in some closure stuff, you get Elixir. Uh, pretty awesome, kind of couple cool things. Honestly, I really love Ruby. Uh, I liked Ruby before, 
and I like it even more after reading this chapter. Hope you enjoyed. Like I said, this was not a comprehensive summary, but hopefully you learned a couple extra things on top of having read chapter two. Look forward to chapter three, I.O., in two or three weeks. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you learned something, and have a great day.